So we're going to start our, our meeting. Um, I'm, hopefully other, other people will join us and not have any troubles with that. So I wanted to just let everybody know for the sake of the meeting, um, if you could turn off your mics when you're um, just kind of listening. And if you do wish to speak, we're going to use the chat option, which uh, Steve will, Stephen will explain in just a second. Um, also, just be aware of any kind of background noise if the radio is playing or the TV is on or something like that, because that can interfere with the people's ability to, um, to hear what other people are saying. Um, so this is something new, but um, um, it's great to see that we have, we actually have more people here at this meeting than we usually have at our informational meetings in the town hall. So um, I'm gonna just kind of turn it over to Stephen at this point and turn my mic off. <laughs> <laughs> it's Michael and welcome to the first uh, online uh, informational meeting anyway in the town of uh, Woodbury. Uh, you could be anywhere else on the internet tonight and nobody would blame you, but you're here and that's great. This is a record turnout for this meeting. This is a very good thing. Um, you might even wonder whether we should make it uh, a permanent uh, event. Um, maybe in person, maybe online, of course. Um, all right, so uh, I think the first thing uh, worth knowing is that this is not going to be an exact model of a town meeting. There's gonna be um, no motions, no amendments, uh, no seconds, no calling the question or anything like that. This is strictly uh, an informational meeting. But there are some traditional ways that uh, uh, we handle town meeting that work perfectly well and, and in fact are really good for a meeting like this. Um, and one is, please don't speak until you're recognized. Uh, and if you want to speak, please write your name in the chat box. Michael will be monitoring the chat box. And uh, as we go through the meeting and people say their piece, um, we'll go through the list. Uh, if I don't see anybody here on the telephone, um, is there somebody calling into this meeting? If, if someone's calling into this meeting, uh, please speak up because there are uh, there's a special way you can uh, symbolically raise your hand uh, if you're not on a computer and you can't call in. Obviously, you can't use the chat box. But uh, anyway, if you are calling in, uh, just press star nine, star nine to raise your hand. And if you're calling in, press star six to unmute. Okay. All right. Um, so if, if you would, just like in town meeting, would you please make an effort to keep uh, your comments to uh, two minutes? In some cases, it will be longer than that, especially uh, uh, explaining some background from article proponents. That might be the case where more than two minutes is necessary. Um, but in general, please try to keep your comments to two minutes. And uh, you're not done after your two minutes, please just let us know and we'll get back to you after everybody else has had a chance to speak. Um, so uh, it's important that everything uh, be said, but, but not everyone has to say it. Uh, repetition doesn't really uh, help um, it's not really necessary. So please keep that in mind. I, I mean, it's bound to happen anyway, but, but let's try to get a handle on it uh, from the beginning. Um, I don't foresee any uh, problems with um, anything else in this meeting. These are generally pretty convivial and orderly meetings. Um, the most important thing for a Zoom meeting uh, if, if you've had, if you've been in these meetings before, when people speak over each other, it's, it's total chaos. And then, and then 
they speak over each other again when they say, no, you go ahead. So it's very important to, to do this in an orderly manner, um, if you would. Okay, uh, Michael, if you don't have any uh, other pointers, we can, we can go ahead with uh, kind of an agenda. And the agenda will be this. We'll go along uh, the ballot. Maybe you have it in front of you and maybe you have the, the town report in front of you. But uh, we can go down the articles one by one and uh, discuss them uh, as they need to be discussed. So let's start with uh, Article 1. Article 1 through uh, has a dozen or so uh, elected positions to be elected. Uh, for Woodbury. And the first one up is uh, moderator. And earlier, you might see my name um, printed on the ballot. That's because I provided a consent form in advance to have that done. That doesn't mean I'm the only one that can be elected. You'll see a, a write-in space uh, below it. Um, and this is the time to let people know if uh, you want to take a crack at being moderator for the purpose of uh, town meetings, I, I highly recommend the experience. I mean, it may seem intimidating and it, it gets a little tedious when you get into Robert's Rules of Orders, but I'm telling you that Robert's Rules of Orders has been a work in progress for 200 years or so. And it is the perfect encapsulation of human nature at, uh, big meetings and uh, it's, it's wonderful in that way. And personally, I will tell you that uh, moderating the meetings in the past uh, bunches of years, um, really it, it's, it's clear that this form of, of town government is really superior and that uh, the democratic process where everybody gets together and crowdsources their wisdom there's no substitute for that. There's no substitute for that. All right, enough of that. Um, is there anybody else who wants to announce their intent uh, to give it a go as town moderator? Uh, if you do, uh, please speak up now so we know who you are and, um, and we'll have the chance to consider and vote for you at uh, town meeting day. Anybody interested in the moderator? Uh, position for a write-in position. Okay, I don't, I don't hear anybody. So let's move on to the next elected uh, position, and that would be town clerk. Uh, there's, uh, and it says on my ballot for one year remaining on a three-year term, and I see Robin Durkee's uh, name on there. Uh, Robin, is is that right? Uh, are you interested in being a town clerk uh, for that uh, one-year remaining period? Yes, sir, I am. All right, very well. Um, I think probably most everybody on this meeting knows who you are, unless they've arrived in town in the last 15 minutes or so. <laughs> um, is there uh, anybody else who might be interested in uh, running for the uh, town clerk position to fill in for one year? Anybody else? Uh, I don't hear uh, anybody. Robin, do you want to uh, add anything? I'd just like to say that I worked for the state of Vermont for 25 years. I, my husband and I opened and ran the Woodbury Village store for 13 years. So just another adventure in my life. Okay, that's a safe bet. <laughs> All right, last call for anybody else who might be interested in running for uh, town clerk, town clerk. Okay, hearing, hearing nothing. The next position to be elected is uh, a member of the select board for a three year term. And there is uh, one uh, candidate on the ballot and one right in spot, the candidate is Christopher uh, Codius, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, Christopher. Hi, uh, Chris, Chris Codius, Sound, sounded perfect. Thank you, Stephen. All right, 
Well, nice to meet you. Um, can you, uh, well, let's first ask if anybody else is uh, out there uh, who's interested in running for the uh, select board position for a uh, term of three years. Anybody else? Well, I don't hear anybody else. Uh, Christopher, can you, uh, would you like to say something to all of us uh, gathered here at this uh, online information meeting? Thanks. Um, so Chris Codius, uh, my wife and I moved to Woodbury about eight years ago. And um, we have two kids, one of whom is at Woodbury School. And um, it's an area that, that we've sort of come home to. Uh, I was born in Northern Vermont, but didn't live in Vermont for most of my life until uh, we moved back for a job. Um, my wife worked at Copley Hospital and now works at the Hardwick Health Center. And I'm a professor at Norwich University. I'm a geologist. Um, it's a town that we like. I've never been in uh, politics ever in my entire life. So this will be quite a new experience for me. Um, but uh, I hope I can support you and in your interests in keeping our town a, a, a great place. Thanks. Thank you, Christopher. Um, any questions for Christopher? Any questions for Christopher, who's running for uh, a select board position for a term of three years? If there are no questions, let's go to the next uh, office to be uh, elected. And that is uh, for Lister for a three year term. On my ballot, I see Robert Martin's name printed and a write in spot. Um, is there uh, anybody other than uh, Robert who intends to uh, run for Lister for a three year term? Anyone interested in running for Lister for a three year term? I think Robert is our uh, presently a uh, lister. Uh, I only see one uh, screen palette in front of me. Robert, are you out there somewhere on the second screen maybe? No. no. I am. I hear Susan. I'm oh. here. Bob's downstairs with his uh, wood boiler. <laughs> okay. But he, he's anxious to represent the town as a lister for another year. All right, you've heard from Susan Martin. That's uh, an authoritative spokesperson for Robert. Uh, anybody else, uh, last call for any interest in uh, running for Lister for a three-year term? Okay, thanks, Susan. Let's move on to the uh, next uh, position. And actually the next two positions are for auditor. The first auditor position is for a three-year term. There are uh, no printed candidates on my ballot. Uh, is there anybody present at this meeting who might be interested in running for a three-year term uh, as auditor? Anybody intending to run for auditor for three years? Um, Stephen? Yes. I just want to mention that if there are any of these positions that uh, remain unfilled, um, that the select board will probably be doing some arm twisting um, after town meeting and trying to find people to fill them and then appointing them. So that's that's another option that we have if, um, but people can still write in. And I, I think Diana mentioned if there are eight eight people writing in for a certain person, then they're sort of um, voted on and they may decline that. Um, but uh, anything that re remains unfilled, the select board will be trying to fill after town meeting. All right. Um, okay, well, you've been forewarned. If nobody runs, uh, you may get a call and be appointed. So uh, please beware. Uh, the second auditor position is for uh, two years on a three-year term. Uh, and Michael or uh, Diana, I wonder, can you just briefly lay out what an auditor does for the town? 
Diana might know that answer better than I do. Basically, they just kind of make sure that um, that bills and the treasurer, you know, are kind of doing their job. Um, they sometimes have suggestions for the select board on ways to uh, make any kind of accounting um, a little bit more um, um, transparent or a little bit easier to understand. Sometimes they have other suggestions for um, the select board. I know Susan has been an auditor before. Maybe she would be able to explain that position to us a little bit better. I just need to look at the checks and balances of the town. Be praised of... Uh town is spending uh, their money, what goes in, what goes out, keep an eye on the checkbooks, to make your own time, make it, make a lot of it, or you can make little, there are certain, uh, <clears throat> there's certain things that you need to accomplish, there's a checklist that's given to you as an auditor, it's very easy to follow been very helpful so is treasure. I don't I don't see any problems next auditing phase. Uh, I've always wanted the town uh, to have the town audited by a professional auditor but that's always been played down and voted down. Okay thanks Susan. Uh, by the way you are breaking up a little bit um, if you're going to speak again, usually one way to cure that is to turn off the video so there's less uh, wave of uh, broadband being used and oh. uh, the vocal is usually more clear with that. Ah. But thanks, I think, I think we got the gist of it. Sorry. That's quite, quite all right. Uh, all right, so uh, I'll ask uh, once again, finally, if there's uh, any interest in either of those uh, two auditor positions, anybody interested uh, in running? If not, let's move on to the next uh, elected office and that would be the collector of delinquent taxes. Ronald Wells is uh, a candidate printed on um, my ballot and probably yours and there's space for a write-in. Is there anybody interested uh, other than uh, Ronald, to uh, take on the one-year term of collector of delinquent taxes. Collector of delinquent taxes for a one-year term. Okay, I don't hear any uh, anybody speaking up to that. So let's move to the next uh, uh, office. The next two offices are for cemetery commissioner, uh, one for a five-year term and one for uh, two years remaining yes, on a five-year term. Fine. Is there uh, anybody interested in running for cemetery commissioner for either of those offices, the five-year term or the uh, two years remaining on the five-year term? This is the one job that um, if you're elected on your first day of work, you'll have hundreds of people under you. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody interested in running? <laughs> I'm sorry. Too much. <laughs> Anybody interested in running for cemetery commissioner? <laughs> Last call. I nominate you, Steve. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Uh, mm. All right, well then let's move to the next uh, position. Uh, and these, uh, the next two positions actually are for a uh, library trustee. The first one is for a one year term and my ballot has Elizabeth Hansen printed on it and a space for a write-in candidate. Is there anybody uh, other than Elizabeth Hansen interested in uh, running for the position of library trustee for a one-year term. Library trustee for one-year term. Uh, I don't hear anybody. Um, Elizabeth, are you out there somewhere? 
I don't hear Elizabeth. So the, the other, the second library position is uh, for a three year term. And on my ballot, Sarah Van Hoff is uh, listed as a candidate and there's a space for a write-in candidate uh, as well. Uh, anybody interested for the three year term as library trustee? Uh, I don't hear any uh, interest. Um, the next two terms are also for, uh, the next two offices are also for library trustee, a two year term. And uh, Stephen Murphy is printed uh, on my ballot. Hello, Steve. Uh, and uh, that is for a two year term. Is there anybody else interested in running for library trustee for a two year term? Two year term. Uh, I don't hear. I don't hear any interest. Um, I think you all can see uh, Stephen uh, on the screen. Uh, he's on the first screen, I believe, under the name Maverick Murphy. Is that right? Yes, that's that's correct. Maverick's my daughter, and uh, this account is set up under her name. Right, the tech expert. I understand. Thank you, Stephen. The uh, the last library position is uh, for a three year term, and so Michelle Duford is listed as the uh, uh, printed candidate on the ballot, and there's space for a write in candidate. Is there anybody interested in uh, running as a write in candidate for library trustee for a three year term? Uh, other than the printed uh, candidate, uh, Michelle Duford. Anybody else interested in that position? Um, hearing no interest, that takes care of uh, uh, Article 1. Stephen? Yes. Stephen, um, Sarah Van Hoff has typed her name into the chat room. Ah, okay. Yeah, you, you were looking for... Uh... Elizabeth wasn't here and I didn't know if Steve was on. So there are people from the library here and we, th there's, I don't have any particular comments. Okay, it's nice to, nice to see the real um, Sarah Van Hoff on the screen anyway. Thank you, Sarah. All right. Um, if there are no more questions or comments about article one, let's um, Stephen, right at the moment, um, I know Avram is here and it, he may want to speak to those of us from town that are here, um, as he might have at town meeting. Um, okay, if, if there's no uh, objection, uh, Avram, we'll be, we'll be happy to hear from you. And um, of course, uh, in your usual concise manner, um, if you can keep it under an hour, we'll really appreciate it. And, and then also, um, before we start going through the different appropriations, uh, there's a person named Teresa Snow here who would like to speak to us about uh, Salvation Farm. So maybe when Avram's done, we can give Ter Teresa a chance to speak also. Right, I notice uh, Teresa will probably want to speak uh, uh, when we take up Article 2. Yes. Since the Salvation Farms yep. uh, is under that article. So that uh, will be... We'll be uh, calling uh, on you then, uh, Teresa, interested in what you have to say. Okay, Avram, uh, please please go ahead. Okay, uh, hello everybody. Before I start, um, and I've got my, uh, my stopwatch going so I won't take up more than an hour as you requested. Um, uh, before I get started, I just wanted to put in a good word for uh, Teresa Snow and Salvation Farms, she and I, spend a fair amount of time on Zoom in other capacities. I'm, I'm the president of the board of Salvation Farm. So uh, I hope you pay attention to what she says in a few minutes. Uh, so uh, hello, everybody. As, as obviously, um, uh, Dave Iacoboni and I will not be making the physical rounds of the four town meetings in our uh, district. And we missed that. So I just thought I uh, would stop in as I did in uh, Worcester had a similar meeting a couple of nights ago um, and, and, uh, and, and just say hello and let you know that both Dave and I are going to be putting out uh, written uh, sort of reports like we usually do, not just our, our weekly or bi-weekly reports, but uh, during the town meeting break when we're actually not in the, in, in, 
in the virtual state house, uh, we try to put out a, a more comprehensive uh, reports and we'll be doing that. And also we are this weekend uh, going to be uh, uh, taping a, an interview. We've got a, a, a friend who volunteered to sort of do a, a, a discussion with us and we will be uh, uh, posting that link on Front, Front Porch Forum, Facebook, uh, and, and all of that. So I don't, I don't want to take up uh, more time or take you know, questions about legislative stuff. But please, if you do have a question or a concern about anything that's going on in the legislature, email or call me. I actually this afternoon got an uh, email from a uh, um, uh, a Woodbury resident uh, with with a concern about a bill that I've, I've started uh, reaching out to the chair of the committee where that bill is. So uh, um, just be in touch with any any concerns you have about anything um, in in the legis in the legislature or in state government for that matter. And thank you. Thank you, Avram. Appreciate you being here uh, for us this evening. Any questions uh, for? Avram, comments. If not, we'll go on to uh, Article 2, which is the uh, appropriation uh, article. Uh, please bear with me while I, I read the uh, appropriation requests to you, and that might give you a, a little time to scan them and uh, look them over and see if you have any questions. Uh, this year, the requested appropriations are $750 to aid to women, men, and children in abuse and rape emergencies. That's the AWARE, A-W-A-R-E organization. $250 to the American Red Cross of New Hampshire and Vermont. $600 to Central Vermont Adult Basic Education. $750 to the Central Vermont Council on Aging. $300 to the Central Vermont Economic Development Corporation, $2,000 to Central Vermont Home Health and Hospice Incorporated, $650 to CIRCLE, that's the Battered Women's Services Organization, $100 to the Family Center of Washington County, $484 to Green Mountain Transit, $50 to Green Up Vermont, $750 to Hardwick Community Television, $200 to Poorhouse of Central Vermont, $100 to the People's Health and Wellness Clinic, $500 to Rural Community Transportation, $200 to Mosaic, formerly the Sexual Assault Crisis Team, $1,000 to Twin Valley Senior Center, $200 to Salvation Farms, $210 to the Vermont Center for Independent Living, $100 to the Vermont Rural Fire Protection Task Force for the Dry Hydrant Program, $1,000 to Washington County Mental Health Services, and $500 to the Washington County Youth Service Bureau. Now we've heard uh, that uh, Teresa Snow uh, is here to tell us uh, something about the uh, requested $200 appropriation to Salvation Farms. Um, so uh, Teresa, please, uh, please tell us about Salvation Farms. Great, <clears throat> can you hear me all right? I can hear you fine. Great. Um, so I'm Teresa Snow. I'm the founder and executive director of Salvation Farms. We are a Morseville-based nonprofit. Uh, this is the first year um, that Salvation Farms has decided to approach any of the towns that we serve in the what we consider Lamoille Valley region uh, for any sort of taxpayer support. Um, and what an interesting year to decide to approach towns for funding. Um, so I wanna first extend a, a, an appreciation to Michael and Carol Ray for really helping us um, with the required signatures. Um, but for those of you that aren't aware of what Salvation Farms is, um, we are an agriculturally uh, focused organization. Uh, we're most known for our gleaning work 
uh, that serves the Lamoa Valley and what gleaning is, uh, is the uh, collection of edible quality produce that uh, farms are not selling or haven't harvested for some reason. Uh, and then that food is distributed to charitable food programs, uh, such like the Woodbury House Food Shelf. Uh, we've been doing this work in the Valley <clears throat> for more than 15 years, uh, give or take. Um, we provide uh, this service to farms uh, and to agencies throughout the Valley at no cost. Uh, this last year in 2020, we provided um, 866 pounds of locally grown surplus produce to the Woodbury Callus Food Shelf. That's around 2,500 servings of fresh produce. Um, additionally, uh, we provided around 7,000 pounds to the Hardwick Area Food Pantry, an additional 3,200 pounds uh, to the Hardwick Area Health Center. Uh, some of those pounds to the Hardwick-based uh, agencies included um, USDA farmers to family food boxes. Uh, that, uh, that was when those boxes were filled with Vermont-grown food. Um, I guess two other points or three other points I'd say is that we are volunteer dependent. And this last year we did engage 142 volunteers who contributed more than 550 hours. Again, pretty surprising in, the, in, the, uh, in a pandemic year uh, to help us uh, serve more than 20 farms um, and move this uh, locally produced surplus produce um, to roughly 40 different agencies. Um, again, including the Woodbury House Food Shelf um, and also serving a few um, senior meal programs in the Northeast Kingdom. So uh, I know you aren't voting on our request uh, alone, but it's a privilege to be included um, in your consideration of, of taxpayer dollar allocations. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Teresa. Uh, that was informative. Does anybody have any uh, questions or comments for Teresa? Uh, with respect to the requested $200 uh, appropriation to Salvation Farms. And I just have, I have one short comment, Steve. I, since the pandemic, um, when I lost um, the work that I've done for about 30 years, I've been working part-time at the Hardwick Area Food Pantry. And every week through the course of the summer, basically through the growing season, um, Salvation Farms makes a pretty hefty delivery of free produce to the Hardwick Area Food Pantry. And there are a number of people from Woodbury that take advantage of, of that food pantry as, as well as the Woodbury Callus one. Um, so really for us um, at the food pantry and providing good local produce to people um, that come to the food pantry, the Salvation Farms is, is essential to what we're able to offer. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Uh, Michael, do you see anybody else in the chat box that wants to make a comment? I do not, not at the moment. Okay, thank you. Um, this is- uh, Steve? Yes. Mary Clark would like to make a comment. Um, okay, Mary, uh, I don't see you on uh, the first screen, but uh, why don't you go ahead and, and make your comment? I um, hopefully you can hear me. I'm keeping my video off right now. This is Mary Clark. Um, I totally support Salvation Farms and um, the efforts they're doing. And obviously, they're doing more for us than um, you know, two hundred dollars worth of our our tax money. And I don't know, Stephen, if there's a way. Can you request an amendment, like to um, say double the amount that we're we're going to pay them to like four hundred dollars uh if it, we could if this was the usual open uh meeting and there were amendments and motions from the floor this year we can't do that uh unfortunately it's it's uh this is an information meeting and at an information meeting we can't uh change anything that's on the ballot but uh certainly your uh suggestion that the appropriation be uh, doubled is uh, in its own way speaks to uh, strong support for this particular appropriation. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. 
Um, so Article Two looks uh, this year like uh, uh, all or nothing approach. At the bottom of my ballot, I see uh, a yes uh, or no, and um, there you have the appropriations. And is there any other uh, comment? Any other comment on the appropriations? If there are none, we'll go to uh, Article Three, which is on the uh, reverse side of the ballot. If you're following along on the ballot, and uh, Please allow me to uh, read to you uh, Article 3. Shall the town have its taxes paid to the town treasurer as tax receiver 60 days after tax bills are mailed and the estimated due date uh, to be October 28, uh, 2021. Taxes would then become delinquent and then be turned over to the collector of delinquent taxes for collection with a penalty that increases by one half percent per month of delinquency to a maximum of 6% for one full year or more of delinquency and interest of 6% per year or one half percent uh, per month. Uh, this is a, a customary article that appears uh, that we usually uh, deal with uh, at the uh, town meeting. Does anybody have any uh, comment or questions on Article 3? Any comment or questions on Article 3? Uh, it's a, a yes or no vote on that, as you can see on your ballot if you're following along. If there are no uh, comments, let's move on to Article 4. Article 4. Uh, says, shall the town appropriate $17,850 to the Woodbury Volunteer Fire Department to be added to the truck replacement fund. $17,850 to the Woodbury fire, uh, Volunteer Fire Department to be added to the truck replacement fund. Are there any, uh, uh, Michael, anybody uh, wishes to speak about that in the chat box? No, um, Teresa Snow just said thank you for allowing um, her time to speak to, to the town about Salvation Farms. She just signed up, but no one has typed in to, um, for our, with a question about Article 4. Okay, very well. Um, that's another article we typically see uh, annually uh, and, and deal with uh, from the floor at town meeting this year. Uh, on Australian ballot. If there are no comments uh, or questions about Article 4, uh, let's move on to Article 5. Article 5, shall the town appropriate $105,296.89 to fund the operations of the Woodbury Volunteer Fire Department, including the capital replacement fund for the fiscal year commencing July 1. 2022, $105,296.89 to fund the operations of the Woodbury Volunteer Fire Department, including the Capital Replacement Fund for the fiscal year commencing July 1, 2022. That is uh, Article 6. It's a yes or no uh, vote. Um, Michael, uh, is anybody uh, in the chat room uh, writing their name to speak to that article? Uh, no, and I, I believe that was Article 5, Stephen. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. But that... no, um, no one has typed in their name. Okay, uh, yeah, sorry about that. I stand corrected. That is Article 5. All right. Um, in that case, if there are no uh, questions or comments, let's move on to Article 6. Uh, please listen to Article 6. Shall the town appropriate up to $85,000 to the Woodbury Volunteer Fire Department Incorporated for the purpose of financing the cost for construction of a new fire and emergency operations center at a total cost of $1,200,000. That's article six, shall the town appropriate up to $85,000 to the Woodbury Volunteer Fire Department Inc 
for the purpose of financing the cost for construction of a new fire and emergency operations center at a total cost of $1,200,000. Uh, that you'll see on your ballot if you're following along is also uh, a yes, no vote. And uh, Michael, I'll ask you if uh, anyone has written their name in the chat room wishing to discuss this. Nothing, nothing at the moment. All right, very well. Um, if there are no comments or questions, let's go on to uh, Article 7. Article 7. Shall the town appropriate $205,129 to meet the expenses and liabilities of the town for general purposes for the period from July 1, 2021 to June 30, 2022? Uh, that Article 7 is also a yes or no vote. Uh, $205,129 to meet the expenses and liabilities of the town for general purposes for the period from July 1, 2021 to June 30, 2022. Uh, Michael, does anybody wish to speak to Article 7? Uh, yes, um, uh, Matt Peters has um, indicated that he would like to speak. And then I think there's someone else too, um, Heather. Um, but Matt Peters is first up on the chat room. There's Heather, okay. Okay, in that case, uh, Matt Peters, uh, you have the floor for the next uh, two minutes if you want the full two minutes. Please, please proceed. Oh, thank you, I, I was actually a little slow on the chat. I was interested in, uh, in a question about article six. I don't know if we can go back to that or not. Um, if there are, are no objections, um, if there are objections, please type your name into, wait a minute, this sounds like town meeting. This is an information meeting and somebody wants to make a comment right. about article six. So uh, Matt, please carry on. Okay, thank you. Um, I just, just wanted to start by saying I certainly uh, greatly appreciate all the work that the uh, fire department folks do. I know it's all a volunteer basis. I just had a few clarifying questions about this uh, additional request that's going to last for a, a fair number of years into the future here. Um, and I appreciated some of the clarification that uh, and it was Chance Payette uh, posted in Front Porch Forum about this request. Um, wondered if we could have perhaps a little bit more definitive uh, idea of the potential effect on our tax bills. Uh, he offered a, a statement in that. I think that it would be uh, something like uh, $60 per 100,000, but there were a number of equivocations there. It just would be useful if anyone can provide a little more uh, certainty around that. And also, uh, I un understood from his uh, statements in that uh, Front Porch Forum posting that uh, the capital cost couldn't be directly shared with Talus because of the nature of uh, the uh, I guess the contracting arrangements with them. Um, I wondered if uh, Callis's uh, contracted rate is somehow higher to uh, uh, to essentially compensate for the capital costs that Woodbury is considering incurring, essentially on their behalf to provide them with service. Okay, thank you, Matt. I I think I've got two questions and, and I want to repeat them to see if uh, I understand them correctly. Uh, and the first is, uh, in general, you're interested about the uh, tax impact of uh, uh, if Article 6 uh, is passed as presented and specifically, um, well, the tax impact, usually it's convenient for people to think about that in terms of uh, the additional uh, tax assessment per $100,000 worth of uh, uh, your particular assessment. Uh, so th I think that's the first question. The second question uh, was uh, given that the town of Woodbury has a fire services contract, uh, given that the Woodbury Fire Department has a fire services uh, contract with uh, the town of Callis, uh, I understand the second question to be, is that is the amount of that contract 
uh, going to change uh, to if if Article Six passes, and I and I assume you're asking if if the amount of the contract is going to go up uh, as a way uh, to defray uh, the cost uh, to uh, Woodbury taxpayers. Now I don't know. I think that's the two uh, questions, Matt. Did I did I repeat them well, or did I garble one of your questions? I, no, I think you captured the the kernel of it. The the latter part, uh, ju really just. Uh, Clarifying is are, are the sort of proportional costs to the town of Woodbury and the contract to the town of Callis somehow uh, endeavoring to recoup some of the capital costs that the town of Woodbury is considering incurring on behalf of the fire department? Right, right. Yeah. Very succinctly stated. Thank you. Shorter than what I. <laughs> so I don't know if there's uh, anybody out there who can uh, determine. Uh, the dollar and cents answer to uh, Matt's first question, which is uh, if, if Article 6 passes, uh, what is the impact uh, on uh, our tax assessments um, going forward? Uh, uh, for a time, it appears, as the, uh, the full amount of the uh, expected cost is $1,200,000. Um, I don't know if there's anybody uh, from the fire department here who can speak to that precise point now. I would expect- I think, I think Chance should be able to answer that question for us. I know uh, he's here. Chance, are you out there? Yeah, I'm here, Steve. Okay, why don't you go ahead, please? Well, I was gonna say, uh, you know, like I wrote in the, uh, in the frequently asked questions section, I am by no means a, a tax matter expert. Um, I basically looked at the previous years and the amount of total tax due, and based on that, came up with a calculation of approximately six cents, which equates to exactly that. It would be $60 for every $100,000 of your house. So if your house costs $200,000 or it's valued at $200,000, sorry, um, your tax bill would go up basically $120 a year. Um, after, rece uh, after posting that, I did get one comment from another person in town that said that that was uh, their calculation as well was six cents. So depending on how things shake out with the town and the state and they when you guys sit down and figure out the rate, it should be roughly about that amount. Okay, does anybody... Uh... Uh, have any reason to suggest that uh, uh, the tax impact will be substantially different than uh, $60 per $100,000 worth of uh, property tax assessment. Uh, Chance, is, is the math up on the, uh, on the fire department website so people can uh, follow it if they want to? No. No, I, I basically just did a breakdown of previous year's tax rates and how much it cost each year there was an increase. Um, I could attempt to maybe map it out and put it out there, but I'm not sure if that would be more confusing to be honest with you. Well, it would definitely only be an estimate uh, because um, you know every year the, uh, the grand list changes a little bit. Uh, it usually goes up, but who knows, it, it may go down. So um, maybe that's, uh, if that's the information we have, then the, that's, that's what we'll go with. That's what we'll go with. And uh, Chance, what about, uh, what about uh, Matt's uh, second question, uh, specifically whether the uh, fire services contract with Callis will um, help with the uh, capital side of the picture? Okay, so for that for that part of the question, uh, the answer, and I don't want to be short, but the answer is no, we are not considering adding more money to their fire services contract. Their fire services contract is just for that. It's for operational cost on a yearly basis. Um, asking them to purchase a building that uh, is in the town of Woodbury just uh, doesn't seem right. We've never done it in the past. And there's other, you know, factors that go into that as well. You know, the uh, one of the questions we receive every year is if we were to uh, fold up shop, 
what happens to all of our property and that you know becomes the town of Woodbury's uh, which now you start entering into a little bit of a quagmire if the town of Callis is paying for it uh, how does it belong to the town of Woodbury if another town is paying for it and there's also the you know there's uh I don't want to get into the weeds too much here but uh, with ISO ratings for your insurance you know, they have a, a 10 rating basically, which means you have no fire coverage. Anybody that's, that's said to have lived outside of a five mile radius from the fire station essentially has no service. Um, now, obviously if you're 5.1 miles, we're still responding, we're still gonna do our job, um, but for insurance purposes, it looks like there's no fire coverage. Most of the town of Callis, if you, if you drive five miles from our station, uh, down Route 14, for instance, it takes you to about uh, uh, Sand Hill. So before you even get to the village of Callis, you've already reached that five miles. Uh, if you go up Boster Hill, it's down in the area of Moscow Woods. Uh, if you go up East Hill and head over to Callis, it's like Bliss Road. Um, so a lot of the town of Callis is beyond that five mile distance. Uh, so the selling piece of this for Callis wouldn't exist because they're not actually going to see the benefit to their ISO insurance ratings. Okay. Um, thanks I'm not for sure that. If I created more questions there. Sorry. Well, no, uh, let me sum up and see if I've got it right. The uh, fire services contract with Callis is based purely on operational costs, not capital costs. Uh, I think I got that. Is that correct? Correct. The, the, the actual budgeted amount is on uh, the fire services. We have in the past asked them for additional money for like the truck funds and the capital replacement funds for our, for our leases and loans on those. So um, if, if there was a request for a capital fund, uh, the, the services contract would not be the place to do it. It would be with another article to present to Callis for action at their town meeting. Correct. Okay. And, and I heard you say that there's, um, there's no obvious benefit to Callis uh, from uh, building, rebuilding the Woodbury fire station. And uh, for that reason, uh, I'm jumping to the conclusion that that's the reason that uh, Callis was not uh, seen as uh, uh, a potential contributor to this. Correct. That, that, that was, you know, one of the two biggest reasons, yes. The other reason is, you know, if we fold up, who, uh, who has ownership of it? And it's the town of Woodbury. So uh, that's why we stuck with the town of Woodbury owning it. It's a Woodbury Fire Department building in the town of Woodbury and the ISO rating. You're absolutely correct, Stephen. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Yeah, that second prospect of uh, the department folding is not uh, one that's uh, fun to entertain for any amount of time. All right, um, was there anybody else who- uh, Stephen, um, Heather, Heather would, has a comment that she would like to make, and then Diana also has one. Okay. Um, I, my, my question was answered, I think pretty much answered by the last I was, I was confused about the relationship between Woodbury and Callis in the fire department. I didn't know anything about that. So I think I understand now. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Heather. D Diana? Okay, a couple of things. I just wanted to point out that uh, we were on Article 7. The $205,000 for the general fund budget does not include any of the other articles. The, but three fire department articles and the uh, social service agency articles. And I just noticed, I think I made a big mistake. On article five, it says for the year commencing July 1, 2022. And that's gonna leave the fire department with a year of no money. Uh -huh. So I don't know how we fix that. <laughs> um. Why don't we just call it a typo and, and uh, not worry about it? <laughs> okay. Well, you know, after having spent 30 years uh, working for the state uh, in a legal capacity, um, I'm fairly confident in telling you that uh, paperwork errors uh, being explained uh, and made well by saying they're a typo 
probably won't fly. Uh, oh, well. You may remember um, a couple of years, more than a couple of years ago, uh, there was a similar error, and I can't remember what it had to do with. And the town's fix was to call a special meeting. And the special meeting, I think, was to rescind the earlier action and to substitute another article. And I'm, you know, not an expert in, in this type of government law specifically, but I would suggest that uh, maybe in our future, we have a uh, special uh, election coming up uh, at which uh, this article will be uh, properly warned uh, without the typo is what I mean. And then um, the election will be had with uh, uh, any action taken on uh, this article uh, rescinded. That's my gut reaction to, to how this works. It leaves a few more footprints uh, than just saying, oops, um, let's go ahead anyway and, and not do what the article says. Uh, so I guess that's, that's something uh, we'll be talking about. Okay. Or so Stephen, um, uh, Chuck has a question and also uh, Chad Waller's just uh, typed in a comment saying that the um, article is, is correct in the town report. So obviously probably the ballot is the one that counts, but um, so it has been worn correctly in one format, um, even if it is incorrect on the ballot. Okay, I think uh, the, the, the purists uh, and, and the legal heads would say they better, they gotta be the same. Right. So I think we're right back where we started. Yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, Chad, uh, eagle eye there, thank you for pointing that out. Uh, Chuck, did you have a comment? Awesome. Yes, I do. Um, <clears throat> the fire department asked for, and I'm sure I won't get the number right, 17000 something for the truck replacement fund? $17,850. And then in the next article, they want 102000 and they're talking about, Ch uh, Chance just mentioned something about to pay leases and stuff in the fire department. So uh, we're... Uh, is that right, uh, Chance? That's $105,000 in Article 5? Yes. Yes, Chuck. You're, and, and is uh, Chuck correct that uh, it's to pay for the ordinary operating expenses, such as paying for leases and that kind of thing? Well, it pays for everything from the leases to the, to the utilities, to fuel for the trucks, its operating expenses, capital replacement, and the truck replacement. What the two so, different articles? So, what are the leases you got to pay if you if you're asking for money to go into the truck fund, and all of a sudden we're paying leases out of the out of your operation fund? What's that all about? Well, that's all about the truck replacement fund was the old way of paying for the trucks, and that's actually ending in four years when those two trucks are finished being paid off. We moved away from the truck replacement fund, and that's just been stagnant at the 17850 to pay off engine four and rescue two. Once those two trucks are paid off, the truck replacement fund goes away. The truck refund, sorry about that, I stumbled. The truck replacement fund, after paying for E4 and rescue two, we started the capital replacement fund to replace that so that we could replace trucks and we could also include things like the SCBA, which need to be replaced. And having never been properly budgeted for that in the past, we needed to uh, get back on track to be able to do those things because we actually ran into a situation uh, last year where the air bottles were no longer certified by the Department of Transportation. So we could take the air packs to a fire, but we couldn't take the bottles to a fire. Okay, so Chance, that. is that capital replacement fund, is that part of the operating, the $105,000 now? Correct. Okay. So doesn't that sort of seem like that should be put on hold until you get done with the truck fund? 
that's paying for engine one and it's paying for the SCBAs. Why would we put that on hold? Because it seems like a, a tremendous amount of money for the town to be putting up for new fire trucks that, are, that you're gonna need in 20 years or 15 years or whatever. And the town budget has no money at all going into an equipment replacement fund. And it seems pretty lopsided to me here. Well, should we fix the highway equipment re replacement fund then? Absolutely. I'm, then I'm looking for money to do it with. Actually, Michael, no, Michael, aren't we putting ninety thousand a year in yeah, the town equipment fund? Yes, yes. Um, the town every year puts ninety thousand dollars into the highway equipment uh, reserve fund, and we also get a chunk of money um, from the Swenson Quarry reimbursement to the town that also goes into that fund. So it's about Depending on how much we get from Swenson, it's uh, 102,000 to 100 and a little bit more. Um, so there is money every year that does get put into that that fund. That's how we paid for the new more brush cutter truck from that. I realize fund. that. I realize yeah. that. But you've got two trucks that are going to need to be replaced, and you ain't got any money to put up to do it with. Well, hopefully we'll have enough money for one here in in a couple of years, or next year actually. But yeah, you're right. It's money is tight. It I is, agree. and no. in the, in this pandemic year and stuff like that, it seems like a tremendous amount of money to be spending when people are struggling to make ends meet. Mm -hmm. That's all I had to say. Thanks for the thanks for the question, Chuck. Uh, Michael, do you see anybody else in the uh, chat room who wants to? Uh... Uh, Ann Peltz is in the chat room now. Um, and did you want to address uh, Article 4 or 5 or 6? Yes, thank you, Stephen. Um, my question is actually sort of an amalgamum of all of them in terms of what the future might look like um, for the town. You know, I understand it's a 20-year bond. And so if we vote to support Article 6 this year, what will that look like for us in the future? Will we be voting on the same amount each year? Um, and Chance, you helped me understand a little bit about Article 4, just in a couple of years that 17,000 may be decreased or may be absorbed into other costs. Like, what it, Can you give us a, a picture of what the next, what the future will look like as far as the appropriations for the fire department? Thank sure, you. Anne. Sure, thank you. Uh, so Article 4, actually, when, when those trucks are paid off, that goes away. That's money we won't be asking for in the future um, because those, those costs will be getting absorbed into the capital replacement fund. That's why it's $31,000 a year for the capital replacement fund to place, replace the big trucks and to replace the big ticket items like the self-contained breathing apparatus. So that $17,850 will go away when those two trucks are paid for. As far as the article's concerned, now this is this is where the, the wording was, should the town appropriate up to 85,000? Because I can't give you an exact dollar amount because maybe the building's only gonna cost 1.1 million. So what happens with the bond is they don't actually bond and give us the bond up front. They they basically hold on to, if, if the town approved the 1.2 million, the bank would hold that 1.2 million and they'd pay it out and we'd pay our bills until the construction was complete. Once the construction was complete, they'd take that tally of whatever the building costs, if it was 1.1 or 1.2, that's what they would send away to get for the bond. Now, obviously this takes into, this does not take into consideration any money that we're doing for fundraising, trying to raise uh, through the BRIC campaign and some other fundraisers. So hopefully that amount will be far less. The first year that the bond is actually created, they'll give us a dollar amount which would be less than that $85,000. And that would be the dollar amount that we would, and we would have to come back every single year for 20 years and say, whatever that dollar amount is, we need it again for another year moving forward. Um, but that dollar amount would stay at that moving forward once it's actually established and the rate is set. So, um, you, there's another person, um, Larry Nancy Ferno. Um, has a question on Article 6. Please go ahead, uh, Larry, or Nancy. <laughs> it's Larry. Nancy won't do this. 
I, some of this may be my own fault, but this whole fire station thing came to me kind of like unknown and getting information on it was pretty difficult. Um, we got it very shortly. We got the town report today. So you were really, really behind on information and I could spend two hours trying to get to the end of this. So I'll try to brief it, but I don't understand this whole construction theory. It's estimated, and this is an estimate at $1,100,000, but yet there's still a ton of unknowns like exclusions for land acquisitions, which there's no amount of money there, ledge removal, there's no amount of money there. And when you get into the construction of it, I don't see, and this may be out there and I may be just naive to it all, but I don't see the information that follows up with <clears throat> the permit costs, the permit process, the sewer systems, and you're dealing in ledge. And I can see where this thing could go blow up to a million five in a big time hurry. And everything that you do with this carries a 29% fee on top of it all. So $100,000 becomes $129,000. And I don't see anything that shows where any attempt was for grants or any other funding to help this thing and any possibilities of creating an income back from this project, which I think there's some opportunities there, but I'm not at all comfortable with how all this came together. And again, it can be my own ignorance. So at the end of the day, this 85,000 could become 150,000. And I, I, uh, I'm just wondering why we can't have all these numbers up front. And I also have a little problem with, I understand that they've taken a piece of land that was given to them, but if the land was given to you and it cost you $500,000 to be able to utilize that land, and some other land is cheaper and can be utilized, I don't see the advantage there either. But again, that may be researched and something more that I don't understand. But the numbers on this thing, I mean, I think it's a, from what I can see, for what information I got, it's very evasive. And that's kind of where I'd either like some answers or where I can find them. Thank you, Larry. Um, Michael, is there anybody else lined up to uh, speak on the uh, fire department articles? There isn't. I'm, I'm wondering if um, Chance, you know, maybe just giving a very brief um, synopsis of the process that you've come to um, for this new building. Uh, maybe, I don't know if that's part of what Larry isn't aware of. Um, that might be helpful to him and, and maybe others also. Um, I think uh, Larry's uh, question is uh, directed toward, toward process, but mostly process as regards the uh, finances of okay. this uh, operation. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it may be a bit time okay. consuming to do that okay. here. All right. and it, it, so it's not like we, we can't do it here, but if right. you want to do it here, I would suggest um, going on to uh, Article 8, which will finish the uh, ballot. Can and anybody hear me? Yes. This is Peter Peltz. I've, I've been trying to get onto the chat. I have a quick question to uh, Chance, if, if you don't and, mind. And there's also, uh, Heather has a question also. Um, so my, it's, it's my understanding that the it's a design build contract. The the the, the neither the contractor the, and the contractor has not been um, determined. So 
I, I question how this could be a firm price. The, 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 uh, you probably all know that the, the, uh, uh, the wood products for construction recently has increased about 30% due to pandemic, uh, the situation in uh, Canada and everything else. I just I wonder how how secure this this number of 1.2 million is, and are you know are we and are we bound to it or 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 how, how are we approaching this matter? Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Um, Heather, uh, please go ahead. Um, what happens? Okay, say we we pass it this time. The eighty-five thousand, and maybe next year. What happens if, in the future year, it isn't passed? Then what happens to the the bond or the the project? Right. Uh, thank you. So the uh, first question, um, if I can restate it, uh, not that it wasn't clearly stated, Peter. Uh, but that uh, the costs, uh, there are some questions about whether the costs include uh, recent uh, impacts on building materials caused by the pandemic and uh, the, the state of affairs in Canada. And then um, Heather points out that if this is a, a yearly um, appropriation, uh, what does the town do uh, or what does the department do uh, if uh, the town uh, turns down uh, that amount? And I don't know if uh, the fire department has uh, answers to that here, uh, but uh, I'll ask uh, if any of the uh, fire department representatives, Chance or, or Paul or anybody has, uh, has a, succinct re response to uh, Peter or Heather's question. All right, well, let's see, uh, let's, let's go with Peter's first. Uh, so the opinion of probable cost, which outlines that 1.19304, whatever the total dollar amount is here, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the first page. Uh, that, was, that was done December 13th. So it's not completely out of date based on the rise in prices on wood, but it's not pre pan uh, completely pre-pandemic either. So this is this is how it works. And we're, we've done the opinion of probable cause based on the drawings that the architects designed for us. And now comes the securing of the funding. So we attempt to secure the funding. Once we secure funding, then it goes out to bid. And that's where we ask uh, contractors to come in and look at look at everything and see what they can do. And obviously if, if the town approved 1.2 million then that's what we have to spend. We can't spend 1.5 million. We can't just draw money out of the bank that's beyond what the town approved. If contractors come forward and the lowest guy says 1.5, well, then it looks like it's not gonna happen at this point in time um, because we're not authorized to spend that money and the bank won't just give us an open check account. Uh, they'll only approve what the town approves. So it really comes back to hopefully these numbers are solid enough that when we go out to bid that we can get this for the 1.2 million or less. And like I said before, with, with hopefully fundraising, we'll be able to, uh, you know, knock some of that out of the park as well, but it's part of the business. I mean, we have to, we have to go with what the town approves and hopefully it's enough. But it, but it, it could be a legitimate concern if, if prices continue to go up over the next you know six months. Yeah, it could be a concern. We may not be able to do the project. Um, Offense, Chance. Oh, I'm sorry yeah. to cut you off, but that's I was, all right. I wasn't sure if that answered Peter's question or not completely. Oh, Peter, is that responsive? Uh, you can address the design build. Whoever priced it. it is, is it my understanding that the person that's going to construct it is also going to help to, in the des des design of it? Or are you, are you, are you, uh, yeah, but I just want uh, going out to bid, but going out to bid based on. Peter, you're uh, breaking up a little bit there. Uh, sometimes that's cured if you can uh, turn off the video. Okay. The audio will come through. Can you just repeat yeah. that? 
I'm just wondering, because I understand it's a design build project. That means that the person who's going to do the construction is also going to be do the designing. If I'm, um, if I'm not correct, um, I stand corrected. But the, so the whoever estimated this cost beforehand is not, go, is not obviously the contractor. Am, am I correct on that? Cor correct. The, the person who did this is a construction consultant. His name is Steve Pitkin. He works independently from the architects. We had uh, John McCullough from uh, Callis, and uh, I'm drawing a name on Patrick's last name. I'm sorry. Kane. Um, thank you. Pat Patrick Kane. <laughs> Patrick Kane. Those were the two architects that did the designs and the floor plans, and then Steve Picking came in behind them and did the opinion of probable cost separately. Okay, uh, Peter. Um, unless uh, unless you want to follow up. Uh, no, that's fine. Thank you. Okay. Thank uh, you, Peter. Chance uh, Heather's question was: uh, What if in the future, in one year, uh, the town uh, turns down uh, the uh, annual appropriation? You can't see me nodding my head right now, Heather, and I apologize. <laughs> I don't want to affect the, the audio quality here. But yeah, unfortunately, this is the nature of the beast uh, for the fire department because we're not a municipal department. We can't commit the town to 20 years worth of paying this. We have to do this on a year by year basis. And we suffer the same gambit, the same run of the gauntlet every single year with our operations budget. And we run it with our truck replacement fund, our capital replacement fund. Any year, people could vote no, and we don't have any money to operate a fire department. If we don't have money to operate a fire department and to pay our bills, the bank takes their stuff. Uh, you know, so any trucks that we've already paid off would remain, you know, property of ours. But whatever the bank owns, they'd take. So they'd take the building too if uh, we stop paying for it. Heather, does that, uh, is that responsive to your question? So Stephen, there's a two other, Diana has a question and Mary Clark is on the chat for comment or question. Okay, if uh, Diana was first in there, let's hear from Diana. Yeah, she was. Okay, I'm just, it wasn't clear for me, to me from the article whether we're approving the 1.2 million in this article or whether we're just approving the first year's amount to get started. You, I'm assuming that in order to get financing from a bank, you would have to have voter approval for the whole thing, but I'm just. Correct. And, that, and that's why it's the 1.2 million for up to 85,000 because they'll tell us what that dollar amount is gonna be under the 85,000, but for the total amount, they have to have approval for that 1.2 million to start paying it out. So this article does approve the 1.2 million. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So um, Mary Clark has a question too, or a comment. I'm not sure which. Mary Clark, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, I guess my comment is to follow up on another citizen that had mentioned about uh, grants. And I think that's a great comment because especially now with COVID and the special financing that's going on, they're really trying to help towns and the fire department is a huge um, important part of our village. So if there's a way, you know, and I don't think it should affect this vote. I support the vote, but I think that it is something that they should follow up with in the future. Thank you. Mary, you're, may I answer that, Stephen? Or yes. Make a comment back. They're, they're, they're actually, Mary, you're absolutely right. And hopefully that's kind of what we're hoping for is that there are going to be some COVID dollars that are going to get slapped around public safety. Uh, you know, we have six EMTs and two EMRs on our department. So we're all responding to, you know, uh, potential COVID cases. Um, we're hoping that there is going to be some money available at some point through those different avenues. Generally speaking, those are shovel ready funding project projects. So we have to be ready to go. We can't be, uh, you know, in the beginning stages when they issue those grants. Um, you actually have to be ready to actually go. So we are hoping that there's going to be something available to offset, you know, some of this through COVID, hopefully. 
but yes, agreed completely. Thank you, Chance. Michael, is there anybody else uh, who has appeared in the chat room and wants to um, speak to? Yes, Robin just appeared in the chat room. Okay, Robin, please go ahead. My question is, when does this $85,000 get given to the fire department? Is it only after they get the bond for sure? Or do they get issued this money as of July 1st? So obviously the first year uh, we wouldn't need it July 1st. We would be actually waiting until the bond gets issued. Um, so basically that money would be earmarked until that happens. Once that happens, then we'd know the actual dollar amount moving forward. And we'd also know the due date of the loan, which we would try to push off, you know, to the middle to end of each year so that we could uh, get tax dollars coming in before those, those bills are due. Okay, yeah. so let's say that you don't get the funding. Then what happens to that $85,000 that we voted that the fire department could have up to? Does it go back to the general fund? Uh, that that would be a question for S Steve or Michael. I'm not sure where that money would go. It wouldn't come to us though, because we wouldn't have a bill to present. It would sit in the, well, it would sit in, I guess, a journal fund. Um, and it might affect the taxes the following year, that surplus. Um, yeah, somehow it would come back to the, the town and unless the fire department is going to try another year or, or try to figure out a different way to, to finance it. Um, and I know just if Brandy were here, um, she would definitely be asking the fire department to, if, if whenever yearly payments are made, it's much easier for the town to make them after sometime in the fall when um, tax money is coming in. July 1st is, we're kind of scraping the bottom of the barrel um, at yeah. that point in time. And, and uh, major expenses then are, are, we usually have, we have in the past had to borrow money until um, tax money came in. So uh, when the financing actually happens, um, I would hope the fire department would take that into consideration. Yeah, we, we did we did that with the capital replacement as well, Michael. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, good. The, fir the first year it had to come out up front because it was due, um, mm -hmm. but then we're actually with both towns moving them to January one, which puts it beyond everybody's tax collection. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yep. Thank you. Um, I don't see any other names, Stephen, at this point in time. All right. In that case, I'll ask for a last call for uh, questions or comments on any of the uh, fire department articles, that would be four, five, or six. Uh, if there are uh, no more uh, questions or comments, I think we've already covered article seven, if memory serves me. And that would bring us to uh, the final article on the ballot, which is article eight. Article eight. Article eight says, shall the town appropriate $571,994 to meet the expenses and liabilities of the town for highway purposes for the period from July 1, 2021 to June 30, 2022. That's $571,994 to meet the expenses and liabilities of the town for highway purposes for the period from July 1, 2021 to June 30, 2022. You've so, um, two, two names have come up in the chat, um, the chance, um, typed his name and Patrick um, Flood has a question. All right, if Chance was uh, up there first, let's, let's hear from Chance. So I was just trying to catch you before you moved on, Steve. I just uh -huh. wanted to let everybody know if they have other, any other questions after this, my email address is on both the Facebook page and the front porch form, and they're more than welcome to uh, email me and we can set up a time to uh, discuss whatever questions they have. Thank you. Okay. So that would be very useful. Okay. Um, Mary Clark uh, just typed in and she has a question about article seven. So um, I'm not sure Patrick came on first, um, but I don't know. 
Is yours about Article 7, Patrick, or is it about Article 8? Article 8. Article 8. Do you mind if Mary speaks no, first? No, that's okay. fine. So, Thank you. Mary? Yeah, I just, I guess I just have a general comment. I've lived in the town now for 20 plus years. And, um, you know, look at how small this amount is for our general operational. I feel like We've had to trim this down so much over the years that it's almost nothing. And it's really, really hard for a town to try to operate, find grants, you know, really kind of bloom uh, with the pressure, I think, of the, of the school uh, uh, costs on top of our taxes. So um, thank you. Just wanted to mention that. I, I just want to make a comment to that, Mary. It's true. Um, you know, we, we really try to keep the budget um, pretty much the way it always has been. And it does mean sometimes that we don't do things that, um, that might be good for the town. Um, somebody mentioned, I think it was Susan about, you know, the auditors have been pushing us and, and our town treasurer Brandy also has to actually have a professional audit done. Um, we have discussed it a number of times. It, it's a fairly hefty chunk of money. Um, and so every time we discuss it, we just decide, you know, um, we kind of let it go because it, it increases the general fund. Um, so there are, are things, and I think we've been pretty lucky to be able to take advantage of grants and, you know, the, the old store that we managed to finally remove, um, you know, that was, took a while, but it was all pretty much funded, the majority of it through grants. And to me, that seems to be the way um, for the town to try to do anything really, um, and just to not really saddle the taxpayers with a, a heavy chunk of money. Um, I mean, the highway fund always seems to creep up every year. Um, you know, there's just a lot of costs for that that are out of our control. Um, but we, we also try to keep that as low as we can. Um, so just a select board member comment on all of that. Well, speaking of the, um, highway costs, uh, if there are no more, uh, questions on, uh, other than article eight, uh, perhaps we should move on to article eight. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Patrick had a question on that one. Uh, thank you, Steve. I just have. I'm just looking for some clarification uh, on the highway budget. Uh, let me start off by saying, at least in my end of town, the roads have been great this winter. And, I, and I'm and i very appreciative of the fact that, uh, you know, Chuck came on and, and uh, the work that he's doing. So uh, it's got nothing to do with any dissatisfaction whatsoever. But I'm having trouble connecting the dots on who who is going to be working uh, for the town highway department. I won't go into all the different places where I've looked and I just can't quite figure it out. So if somebody could just give a quick summary of the positions and who, you know, full-time, part-time, et cetera, that would be very helpful. And then I can go back and maybe connect the dots. Okay, would, would, would you like me to attempt that, Chuck? So. Yeah, I can. Okay, and I'm happy to try to, to do it, try to do it too, if you'd like. Okay, well, go for it if you want. Okay, um, and you correct me if I'm wrong and add anything that I forget. Um, so one of the changes that's gonna be happening um, is with the road crew. Um, we are going to uh, be hiring a third full-time person. So that's one of the, the increases with the, uh, the highway budget. Right at the moment, um, we have two full-time members and two part-time members. It's been that way for a few years now. Um, and it really just, and Chuck can speak to this more, to just for the efficiency of work, it really makes sense to have a third full-time person. Be the two part-time people have basically been, uh, you know, half-time positions. So, um, and it's just a coordination of, you know, who who comes in on what day and how much time you have to take, bring somebody up to speed on what's being done. 
So the commitment with a third full-time person does also include uh, insurance and other benefits. So there's an a increase in cost that way. Um, that's so. That's um, you know, as far as the road crew, that's that that'll be a change, and that'll happen. Um, well, shortly after town meeting, we'll be starting um, the process of uh, hiring an. Um, a third full-time person in it. And it might be one of the part-timers. It might be somebody completely different. Um, just have to wait and see who, who shows up for the job. Um, uh, another specific question, Michael. So in the, in the budget, it shows the road commissioner compensation is $7,500. That sounds to me like a very part-time uh, job or what do we anticipate there? We originally, we budgeted about $10,000 for that when we uh, knew that we were gonna be creating that position. That was le this, actually this fiscal year, we budgeted $10,000 and Chuck's hours um, and the actual cost came to $7,500. Um, that will probably increase um, some. I, th I think we budgeted $10,000 for that for fiscal year 22 also. Um, and Paul um, or Brian, you know, correct me if um, I think that's what we budgeted for that. Um, you're, you're correct, Michael. That's spot on. Yep. Okay. And you know, Chuck right now is uh, kind of keeping an eye on the road crew from Florida, um, and he's not charging the town anything for uh, a fair amount of time that he's spending uh, while he's um, down there soaking up that nice sunshine. Um, He's um, so, and he's definitely, of course, much more involved um, with the, you know, the summertime part. And, you know, I think having a road commissioner was a really good thing to do. It, it really cleared up a lot of tensions and confusions between the road crew and the select board. Um, you know, Chuck really knows what to do and he's done a really great job working with the road crew. You know, he was kind of stuck in the middle between the select board and the and the road crew and um, kind of very skillfully worked with both ends of the um, of the stick on that. Um, so I, I think, you know, so that's another addition, um, but I, I think it's definitely um, has proven to be a, a good choice. Um, yeah, Michael, so uh, I agree. I as I said in the beginning, I think it's a it's been a good move, and I want to thank Chuck for everything he's doing, even if he's in Florida while we're up here. But um, the uh, another sort of picky yoon question in the budget it it lists uh, five hundred dollars for a highway administrator. That, Who's that? That is that is a position that I have been doing. I basically. Um, I'm doing a lot less of that now that we have a road commissioner, um, but my my uh, role um, as a town highway administrative assistant was to do uh, oversee the grants, uh, submitting grants, uh, doing grant reports. Um, and I would sort of be a go between between the road crew and different town residents, um, any kind of uh, paperwork kind of administrative stuff that the road crew uh, really didn't want to deal with. I mean, they want to work on the road. So that has been a position that I've had for, um, well, I guess after our former road foreman left, um, I've been doing that. Um, it's a per hour basis. I've been, I'm charging a $15 and 45 cents an hour for that work. Um, and uh, this past summer with Chuck on board, I really didn't do much of anything, just a, a couple of grant reports. Um, so, okay, um, thank you. Yeah. And I also do um, the, the beaver thing that you see. Um, that's also through the road crew. That's basically me um, taking care of beaver that are trying to plug culverts or build dams and flood the road. Um, it's a great job. I love it. Um, I get to do a little tour of town every morning and um, uh, get great challenges from our local little furry flat tailed rats. Um, so, um, so that's another that's another job that I have that basically is a, a, a town highway um, expenditure. It's my Thank favorite you. job in town. 
<laughs> well, not according to the beavers, it is. Right. Well, they don't. They don't um, complain too much, at least directly to me or to anyone else. So. <laughs> you should. You should hear them when you're not around. That's true. Yep. Is there uh, anybody else who who has a question or comment about Article Eight? Article Eight. The town. Um, just to get. To, Chuck, go ahead. Just to sort of address Patrick's question about uh, Mike has been a big help as far as knowing what goes on with the state and stuff. Um, I've come to him quite a few times with questions and stuff. I understand the construction part of it, but the grants and all that stuff, it's sort of out in left field for me. I'm just beginning to catch on now. So whatever Mike's been getting, he absolutely deserves. Yes, he does. Sorry if I speak, Steve. Yes, please, Paul, go ahead. Yeah, and this sort of touches on what Patrick and Mary were talking about. One of the things, as I've been on the select board two years now, and I guess Chris wants to throw his hat in the ring, and he'll find out the same thing I did, is uh, Michael's filled a big gap, and now Chuck's taken a lot of that work. Um, just my perspective from coming in from the outside is there's still a pretty substantial gap in services that probably should and could be done in the time people have to do it. So that's something I think moving forward, we may all want to address um, just because I know our time gets very busy and frequently there isn't enough time to do a lot of the things that ought to be done, uh, like deal with highway grants and things. Because would you say that's probably a fair statement, Michael? Mm -hmm. Very difficult yeah. to come in with these things and we've got secretarial help to get minutes out. So I was really surprised on um, how much there was um, so, so moving forward, there may be some more needs there. Just we're figuring out what that might be. Um, and again, having it, if Chris gets elected, he might have some great ideas on the, how to, how to resolve some of this. Cause obviously uh, most of us are stretched pretty thin um, uh, getting, getting it all done. I, I got to be in charge of a paving pr project this summer, which was a, a lot of fun and took a lot more time than one would expect. So anyway, so I, I think everyone's doing a great job and I was very, very happy with Chuck's work too. Thank you, thank you, Paul. Um, uh, your uh, paperwork skills are obviously uh, admired and needed, uh, Michael. So thanks for that. Mm -hmm. All right, um, Michael, is there anybody else in the chat room that uh, wishes to speak to Article Eight? Uh, no. Uh, if not, we've we've covered uh, all of the eight articles. Uh, on the ballot and we've discovered one uh, interesting glitch so we may be uh, revisiting that uh, in the future and uh, if there is no uh, other comment again i'd like to uh, thank you you could be anywhere else on the internet tonight uh, sure. but here this Stephen, is i have a couple comments that I'd like i'd like to make before we all um click the leave button um First of all, I'd like to thank a couple of people. I'd like to thank um, Brian for his many, many years on the select board off and on. Um, chances are he'll be back again. That seems to be something that he does. Um, and, you know, he definitely is a go-to person in town um, for many, many town residents. Um, but Brian, I wanted to thank you for the many years that you have served on the select board role and, and kind of as a uh, uh, ear for anybody who has concerns uh, at the shop there. Um, and I would bet that you'd be back on the select board at some point in time. That seems to be what happens, but you're, of course, you're always <laughs> welcome. Um, and I also want to thank Diana. Um, I, I'm sure we haven't seen the last of her around town, but, um, you know, she's been uh, our town clerk, I guess for 10 years now. And, you know, I've been on the select board now for seven years and Diana has been an, an awful lot of help to myself and other select board members um, just in, in keeping us in line or answering questions about things. She's had a number of roles in town. Um, it's been very helpful to me anyway. Um, for stuff and and um, I'm one thing I really appreciate about Diana is that if she has something to say, she says it. 
And um, usually there's a good discussion from there and um, I appreciate that. Um, I've, I've had my ear chewed out a bit here, but we've always had a good discussion about it. So, so thank you, Diana, for good job. Yeah. And I too wish to thank Brian and Diana. I uh, got a new appreciation for folks that stay on the select board for 10 years and whatnot. So uh, thank you for your service, Brian and, and Diana. Appreciate that. It's been good working with you. I'm sure we'll see you around. Yeah. Good. Uh, good. Yeah. It's uh, this, uh, this town has been gone for over 200 years. Uh, with uh, people like those you see here uh, serving, uh, uh, definitely not in it for the money, but to uh, make, us, uh, make this place a, a good place to live. And uh, hopefully we'll be at it for another 200 years. All right, hmm. so. Um, not me. <laughs> <laughs> I won't make 200. <laughs> I was metaphorically speaking there. Okay. All right. So um, if there are no more uh, comments or, or observations, thank you for uh, showing. I'm still kind of waiting for an answer for the comments I made. You want to jump down to Article 8 and then go back to it. So here we are through 8. And uh, I'd like to go back to it. Uh, to Article 8? You, no, you wanted to wait that you went through Article 8 before you discussed the questions on the uh, article six. Oh, all right. Um, is that uh, well? I think I, it's it's been a while. I, I've sort of forgot your uh, question, Larry. Uh, maybe if you can. This is you, the story of my life. I'm sort of forgotten most of the time. <laughs> it's not the first time. I hear you. So um, maybe. Uh, if you if you repeat the uh, the gist of your questions, uh, maybe uh, Chance can address them now, or uh, he's invited uh, some personal contact for later. Um, I, I sent an email to Chance, and uh, he thanked me for my comment, but then didn't answer any of my questions. Um, all right, I guess uh, maybe he uh, well. I guess now he knows he's, he's uh, you have some more questions you'd like uh, addressed. And uh, if we get the gist of those uh, questions, uh, Chance, uh, maybe you can, you can say whether you can respond to them or not and, and in a summary manner, uh, if that's what it takes. Um, so let's take it a piece at a time uh, and let's wrap it up with um, article six then. Uh, so, Larry, would you please uh, just summarize your questions again so we, we have them at the top of our mind? Okay. So just generally, the whole idea of this construction leaves me with a ton of questions, and it's the amount of money, basically, and then the unknowns. And one of the big unknowns that sticks out here is when it comes down to the bear, uh, some exclusions, some of them which are the appropriation of land and ledge removal. And I, there's no cost associated with that. And we're trying to build a project that we don't even own the land. So how do we get to this point? So what, you know, so if you're, you're looking at one, one, uh, one, one million, one hundred thousand, but yet there's so many things that are left out of this that have got to be brought into it that are kind of like unknowns. That's one big one. And then you have, there's no permit process be done. And I don't know if it can be or can't be, but that would being that you want to work in ledge when you start getting into sewer systems, drainage systems, those become very, very expensive and to try to do this with that being unknown, that leads me to believe that this project can go quickly from one million, one million one to one five. And that's what that's not what you're voting for here. So the bottom line here is with all the the way I look at this, with everything that's missing, it's kind of like 
not really ready to even be brought to a vote because of all the, I mean, there's no, there's a lot of unknowns. There's not a lot of what the costs are. And I, I'm not even sure from what I read about this, that the building is adequate to house the fire department when you get it all said and done. So those are my, those are a few of my concerns. Thanks, Larry. That's, um, I was going to say, Steve, you want me to try to just address a couple of those real quick, if I can? Yes, please. Sure. Okay, so the exclusions that you see listed there, Larry, one of them is hazardous materials, lead abatement, and asbestos abatement. We've already tested it for lead and asbestos. There is none. So that's not going to apply. The land acquisition, we actually do own the land. We own the property. The land acquisition was based on whether or not we were going to be able to get approved to not have to have a sprinkler system which we had been approved the last time we looked at building this about seven years ago, we got approved for the waiver for that. The land acquisition was just there in case we needed to talk to a landowner to get you know, uh, an elevated water source, which we're not sure. It sounds like we'll be able to get the same uh, waiver from the state that we had the last time, but we're not positive. Uh, ledge removal, uh, well, ledge removal is ledge removal, depending on how much you need to remove. Um, fees, there, there are permits. We've already applied for the permits for the town of Woodbury. We've already gone through that process and done the, the uh, zoning uh, request. Um, now we have to move on to, you know, the stormwater runoffs and those types of things with the state, uh, which uh, we will be getting working on here soon. Um, I think that covers most of the exclusions except for an air compressor because it was kind of one of those things that was how much is an air compressor going to cost? Uh, how big of an air compressor do we need? Um, and that was one of the things that got left out and that's why it's under the exclusion list. But we do own the property, Larry. So let me understand why you had that in there that, that it had to be made possibly purchased for what reason? For, for a sprinkler system, if we needed to have a sprinkler system, then we needed to have the, we, we were going to have to work something out with the landowner above us to have an elevated source for water supply for a sprinkler system. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds like we need to buy land, but we don't. It was given yeah. to us by Vermont. And Chance, I'll, I'll speak to that. We will not have to do that. They, uh, they will give us the same variance because we don't have a municipal water supply. Thank you. Thank you. So when you go into like the septic systems and the, the floor drains, what yep. happens with that particular well, the, operation? Again, the septic system, because we're, 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 we're not a municipal fire department, but they loop us in as a municipal fire department because we're providing services for the town. They'll actually give us a waiver and we don't require a septic system or a drainage, uh, a leach field, sorry. Um, We'll, we'll be having a holding tank. That's where the cost for that, uh, there's a $10,000 cost for a tank in there for the septic. And I'll speak to the floor drain. We've already got uh, approval from the state to do an, uh, what will happen is it'll go through a grease and oil separator and the water from washing will be just pumped out onto the lawn. That's been approved already. So the water gets pumped without being treated? No, it goes through a grease and oil, not the sewage. I'm talking about wash water from washing trucks. But you don't have to treat it. Correct. It goes through a grease and oil separator. As long as you pump it on top of the ground, which would be on the lawn, uh, that's an adequate method for uh, removal of wash water. Okay. So then as far as the septic, you're just going to have a holding tank? Correct. And then what do you do with that? Pump it? That has to be pumped out. Yep. A lot of the buildings in the village have holding tanks. Yeah, our toilet use is very low. And the building itself is not adequate to house all the equipment. No, that, that, that building's about ready to fall in on itself. That's why there's demolition costs in there to, to remove. No, the but I'm talking about the, the, the new building that you're building is That's that is not adequate to house all the equipment that the fire department now owns. No, it, it would only be four bays wide uh, because of the restriction on the on the property size. 
the, the alternative was the two and a half million dollar station that was outside of the town limits. Uh, we're not down there. So we still have to maintain another fire department. We already maintained two now, so we'd still be maintaining two. Plus at a cost of another of a, another million dollars. So. Sure. Okay. Is that uh, responsive, uh, Larry? Can you think of anything else while we're all uh, together? Uh, no. <laughs> Nothing. Uh, no, we'd be here too long. So let's. We're, we're headed in the right direction. Thanks. Okay. Chance did mention that you know, give him a call if you have questions. Uh, I would invite. You, I'll switch my hat, Larry, as the fire chief. I'd invite you to go meet with Chance and I at the building if you really want answers to these questions. I'd be glad to show you around and uh, answer the questions as best we can. I can assure you, we've done due diligence on this. I've been involved in construction inspections for 33 years. I am familiar with. Uh, all the pitfalls of this stuff. I, I'm not arguing that they're not doing due diligence and I'm not arguing that volunteers are a very important part because no town runs without them. Uh, I like, but I like to see something that's going to stay with us for a long time and meet future needs. So like in the next 20, you, you got a bond out here for 20 years. And you got 20 years of changes coming. Uh, I like to see them match up and get under one roof. And I, I also noticed there's a big uptick as far as the ambulance services and stuff goes. And I like to see that under that wing if it's possible to. Yeah, we won't be having an ambulance. No, but uh, we'd be glad to meet with you, Larry. I'd love to have yeah. you reach out to me yeah. and, and yep. Chance and come talk to us. Yep, sounds good. So if you'd like my phone number, I'll give it to you right now. I'm sure I got it somewhere. I'll find it. Okay, you. please reach out to us. We would love to answer your questions. Uh, we're not trying to be evasive at all. I think oh. people that have supported us over the years understand that we've done our very best to, to serve and to do the best with the funds that we've been given. I'd like you to see you get the right funds, and I'd like to see it go well. Yeah, and we are. I mean, I, we, this is a compromise from our first project. Uh, those that were here in 14 know that uh, we were charged with getting a project that was less expensive and one that was in the village. And that's why we're in where we are. Okay. So thank you, Larry. Glad, to, glad to be. Thank you, Larry. Yep. We'll talk. Thanks. All right. Good then. Um, I think uh, maybe now uh, I can say with some confidence that, uh, We've uh, combed through the uh, articles uh, for as much as people want to do. And we'll thank uh, uh, Diana and Brian again for their services. And uh, if that's all, then I'll say good night to everybody and uh, thanks again for showing up. This was a, a great show and we'll see each other later, I know. So thanks, Jim. I. I and I, I just wanted to mention that if you know of anyone that wasn't able to come to this meeting, um, but would like to sit through the two hours that we've been together and hear what was said, um, you can go to the um, Hardwick Community Television um, website, hctv.us, and watch the whole meeting. Uh, it's been recorded, um, so it is available for other people in town if they want to watch it or if you wanna see it all over again, um, without commercials, um, it's, it's available.